All right, looks like we are live. I want to welcome everybody to Standing for Truth. I am your host, SFT. If you enjoy this ministry and are not yet subscribed, then please make sure to hit that subscribe button. If you are already subscribed, then please share around this important content. Now, before I bring in Professor David McQueen and uh, our award-winning co-host, George Bond, I'm going to go over a couple reminders for everybody. We've got uh, a pack-filled summer of events, and uh, this Wednesday we will have uh, Dr. Frank Turek on the show for a talk on I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. So there will be a live audience Q&A. Make sure you are bringing your questions. Uh, Thursday, we've got the big debate between Dr. Kenny Rhodes from Reasons to Believe versus Dr. Kent Hoven, and they will be debating the age of the earth. So make sure you are here for that. Also, please check the past shows. We had a busy week last week, and we also put out a video last night, uh, Raw Matt and myself uh, debunking the critic, specifically Joel Duff. So that being said, let us bring in Professor David McQueen and George Bond. Gentlemen, brothers, thanks so much for being here. It's so good to see uh, you guys again. It's been three weeks for me. Uh, I've been missing you, George. Oh, thank you, David. Uh, <laughs> likewise. It's, a, it's an interesting subject for me. I didn't know much about South Africa. I knew about the diamonds and the gold, but that's about well, all. And uh, it was good uh, to do a bit of research on it. Yeah, and I appreciate your help. 
the class, I want you to know the format is I'm going to give a five minute introduction to what we're going to be doing. Uh, George will do the same. And then after that, I'll come back for a 20 minute introduction to what me, what might be called biblical geology, creation geology, which precedes flood geology. We'll talk about that. And then George has 20 minutes that he has prepared. And then we'll take Q&A uh, up until the one hour break. And then after the one hour break, we'll come back and, and talk in some detail about um, the whole issue of how old are the diamonds, according to the evolutionary community, in the Kimberlites of South Africa. But here is how I want to begin. I spilled water on it a few minutes ago, so I can't put it on over my keyboard. We want to talk about models, the old earth model versus the young earth model. And I want to use a style that I've used in my teaching over the last 50 years. And that is the style of a jigsaw puzzle. George, I guess you know the old joke about uh, an Australian was putting this puzzle together and it says eight plus years there. <laughs> and yep. so the Australian worked on it for a whole year and his wife said, well, why are you taking so long? He said, well, it takes eight years. <laughs> yeah. So what's my point? This is a 500 piece uh, uh, jigsaw puzzle. My wife and some of my children have the patience for this. And this is the beautiful picture that it depicts. And we'll be talking about mountains. So I picked out a mountain scene. But I want to pose this question. What's the most important part of this jigsaw puzzle? Well, it's obviously the picture on the front. Because once you get all the flat pieces around the edges, how do you know how to put the rest of it on? Well, as you take the pieces out, you leave the picture right there, and that tells you how to put it together. How does that tie into our discussion of young earth creationism versus traditional evolutionary geology? Well, the framework of Genesis gives us a basis for understanding how to put the puzzle together. What do I mean by that? If you look at two models, and we're going into a part of the world that most people don't even know uh, where Botswana is and Zimbabwe and their relationship to South Africa. We're going into a, a world of geology that uh, many creation science have not, have not dealt with. So in order to understand it, we need a framework. Now the old German theologians had two words that they used uh, all through the 1800s and early 1900s. And those were the German words, Weltbild and Weltanschauung. Well, Weltbild means a picture of the world. Weltanschauung is the philosophical view of how the world came to be. So the, the Weltbild will be the data that George and I will be sharing about the cratons of Southern Africa and details about that. But the Weltanschauung is the picture on the front of the, of the box. The evolutionary community wants us to believe that these mountains that you see here and the topography, the geomorphology, all flowed by time plus chance and impersonal forces into a picture of geology that is old and slow not young and fast the way the catastrophic view takes it. And so we want to challenge our critics to what's called a multiple working hypothesis. Let's view uh, the geology of creation, the geology of the great flood as one model and the traditional uh, billions of years of uh, the evolutionary viewpoint, the other model. So what fits better, billions or thousands? How do you react to that, George? 
while there's lots of evidence to um, suggest or indicate that it's a young Earth, but uh, others have got uh, pre-existing presuppositions and uh, it uh, conflicts with their narrative. How true. I'm finished, George, with my five minutes. Go ahead with yours. Oh, okay. Well, uh, standing, I'd like you to share my screen, please. Definitely, brother. And I want to let the audience know, um, please tag me with your questions. If you're a critic, you know, tag us with your objections in the form of a question, because uh, we are going to be having an audience Q&A. As we always do, we like to make this interactive. So tag me at Standing for Truth. In 40 minutes, we'll be ready for your questions. So send them over to SFT. Is that coming through? It is. It is. Yeah. It looks beautiful, George. Uh, okay. Well, sorry to... Um, I guess this is basic uh, high school uh, geography. Um, Africa, as you can see there, and the island to the east is uh, Madagascar. It's situated just south of uh, Europe and uh, west of Australia and east of South America. Um, the topic today is about South Africa and South Africa is that uh, area that's shaded light brown or orange at the bottom. Uh, now South Africa is uh, the country at the southernmost corner of the continent. It's flanked by the Indian Ocean and to the east and the Atlantic Ocean to the to the west. Now South Africa holds I think most of you probably know that it holds the, uh, the largest gold and platinum deposits. Uh, it has the world's best quality diamond, and we'll be talking about diamonds in more detail later on. And it also has significant deposits of iron and uh, coal. All right, the central area is uh, composed of crystalline uh, rocks, mainly gneiss and granite, but also mafic, ultramafic volcanic sequences. I'm sure David will talk about the geology of South Africa in more detail, but that's a sort of close-up um, map of South Africa, and I'm sure we'll touch on the Kimberley or the Kimberleys. Um, the Kimberlites are named after Kimberley. I think it's Lord Kimberley. So um, I'm not sure whether I should... Um, take up too much time but just to, a few terms there will introduce you to some geology of South Africa but just some terms uh, we need to sort of um, uh, get a, get our head around off you might hear uh, Professor McQueen say the word craton or craton yes. uh, this is this is just a large stable block of the earth's crust forming the nucleus of a continent. Usually, uh, th I believe it, it'd be uh, some form of granite. And also with uh, South Africa, you may hear the, the word cast, K-A-R-S-T. Now, this is just a landscape underlined by limestone, which has been eroded by a dissolution, producing ridges, towers, fissures, sinkholes, and other characteristic landforms like caves, etc. Um yeah, look, uh, I won't take any more of of, uh, of that. I think that was an interesting uh, sort of introduction just to get people around the geography and where South Africa is and why we're going to talk about its geology. You'll see later on some of the um, images that I've captured of uh, folding ranges, etc. why we believe it, it, it fits within the biblical global flood narrative. Yeah. And um, yeah, without without going too too fur, too much into it, uh, I'll pass it on to Professor McQueen to get the ball rolling on the geology part of it. Okay, good. Uh, thank you, George. That's an excellent introduction, and you'll see that my uh, diagrams are an attempt to simplify what you uh, did such a wonderful job on there, uh, and. Help me keep track of the time. Uh, 20 minutes from now should be about, um, I guess, uh, let's see. It's uh, about the 34-minute mark. Okay, good. Thank you. 
help me keep track of my 20 minutes. Okay, we're going to talk about the flood geology of South Africa and then Southern Africa because I want to make a comment about my field work in the country of Zimbabwe in 2019. In preparing for this, I see I want to put off until next month uh, a detailed discussion of the granites and biotites that I found in uh, Zimbabwe. So we'll focus a lot on uh, uh, South Africa. And I have taught geography in my day. And so I like to depict continents as geometrical figures, squares, rectangles, triangles. And so here is a triangular uh, view of Africa with the equator at Victoria Falls. And we're going to emphasize this uh, area circled in red here. Africa is a fascinating place. And we're going to see next hour exactly where he fits in biblically. But we want to learn some of the vocabulary uh, that I have summarized here. The uh, E there is the equator uh, in Southern Africa. And we need to learn some of the uh, countries that are north of South Africa. For those of you that received your education in the 20th century, uh, you'll be interested in some details. It turns out that N Namibia in the old days, 1884, was called German Southwest Africa. And it changed hands and was argued through the League of Nations and the UN, but finally became its own country. And so Namibia is the N there. The B stands for Botswana. Uh, Z is Zimbabwe. You'll notice I've drawn Victoria Falls. The body of water north of Victoria Falls uh, is right where the equator is in Africa. And then the country of Mozambique is to the east of Zimbabwe. Now, south of all four of these countries is South Africa itself. Uh, you may recall that Zimbabwe, uh, when I was going through my schooling early on in the 60s, that was Rhodesia. And the capital was uh, Salisbury. Uh, when the revolution came, they changed the country name to Zimbabwe. And the uh, capital is now called Harare. And so there have been a lot of changes in uh, Africa, but no change in the geology. The reason the Germans were in Namibia back in the old days, Southwest Africa, and the reason that the Brits and the Irish flooded into Rhodesia was the fantastic mineral wealth. When Rhodesia was up and running, uh, Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, was the breadbasket of Africa. Uh, huge uh, crops were grown there. And uh, it is so sad with that background that there's some real starvation going on, especially with the COVID lockdown in uh, Zimbabwe. Now, let's turn to a summary of the uh, uh, geology. You heard George mention the word craton. Now, this is the cup vol. Now, this is Afrikaans. Uh, it's, uh, it's a mixture of Dutch and German and uh, other European languages. But uh, Afrikaans, I think it's pronounced cup vol craton. And that's one of the cratons that George showed you on the geologic map. That's one we're going to emphasize. Now, why emphasize that particular craton? Well, once again, we have to make sure that we're using the words correctly. Craton is a word referring to Precambrian rocks that um, are rocks without fossils. We will see how that fits into the biblical picture. But let me use a couple of toys that I once again, borrowed from my grandchildren. 
to see how we're going to use the word dyke to talk about what happens in a crayon, craton. So imagine each one of these, the green one and the orange one, to be what's called a dyke. Now, in European vocabulary, it's spelled D-Y-K-E. In the U.S., for some reason, most professors use the word D-I-K-E. And the way that the word is used is if you have a, a bedrock, a craton, that's got some layering in it or foliation, and you've got something that cuts across it, that's called a dike. If you have an igneous rock that flows up in it and parallels that foliation, that is called a sill, S-I-L-L. -L. So we're going to be talking about kimberlite dikes. And these are so big that I can put them down on Mrs. McQueen's kitchen floor as an illustration of the floor being the boundary between the crust and the mantle. And so at a certain point, uh, probably during creation week, and then perhaps also later on during the flood, um, a unique kind of igneous rock called a kimberlite blasted up from uh, the mantle to the into the crust. Now, for those of you that are young watching this, you might get a kick out of this. So let's make this blast up. So there it goes. Oh, it blasted all the way up. Whoops, I'm about to knock my computer over. And so it very quickly moved up into the crust. Now, why is that important in a young earth creation model? You don't need millions of years for these kimberlite dikes to erupt and move. They, they move up within a matter of days, going up through fractures and so forth uh, in the rock. And so now if you're writing these things down, you know the word craton, the word dike, and the word seal. So let's see what else we have on our introduction here. So the Capval craton is uh, where we're going to be talking about these kimberlites. Now we get into some geology that even professional geologists have to go back and um, write some words down. When I was going through college in the early 70s, what is now called the Neo-Proterozoic was simply called the Precambrian. If it had any word at all, it had words associated with the geology of Canada. Words like um, Archean and other words like that that are used for the Craton in Canada. But in the geology of South Africa, they talk now about the Neo-Protozoic era. Now, notice that that runs from a billion years in the evolutionary model up to 541 million years. Now, we've talked about this enough that that should ring a bell. 541 million years ago is the beginning of the Cambrian. And so that is the beginning of the Salk sequence that uh, Tim Clary has done such a wonderful job to document, and we will this fall come back to this whole topic of sequence stratigraphy. But the only thing you need to know today is that the Cambrian is right on top of this, uh, about on the top of this craton. Now, the next thing you need to realize is that this part of, of South Africa that we've talked about was part of a supercontinent called the Rodina. I must admit, George, I had to laugh almost when I saw that because I think that's close to the Russian word for mother. Uh, I don't quite know my Russian very well. But I think oh, neither, neither do I. <laughs> uh, so, something close to that. Okay, now this ties into what we've talked about in the past. Biblically, on the third day of creation, we have this C-shaped uh, continent, one world continent, E is where I suspect Eden was. Uh, and R is uh, this Rodina. This is the 
uh, South African supercontinent that includes part. If you see over my shoulder on this side, if I can get my hand going right, there's the continent of Antarctica. And so Antarctica was once part of this uh, Rodina. Now let's keep on going here. Precambrian rocks in the flood geology model or creation week model, if you will, uh, are rocks without fossils created on day three. I will save until after the break a discussion of what exactly happened biblically on day three. But for now, uh, we will end our summary there. I hope, uh, George, you make note of those new geology words because at Christmas you're going to receive your diploma from me as a <laughs> real geologist. Uh, thanks. Uh, standing. Can I share the screen? Because I want to add to something that uh, Professor McQueen had had shown, uh, some diagrams that, that, would, uh, that will uh, illustrate exactly what he was talking about. Definitely, yeah, if you want to share a screen. And to the, everybody in the chat, make sure you are tagging me at Standing for Truth with your questions or objections. So, uh, Brother George, you wanted me to share your screen? Yep. You're good to, you're you good see, to go. Can you, can you see that? Yes. That's that's what uh, Professor McQueen was talking about. This that's that's the seal there, a dike going up. Your your, your main uh, lava flow. Uh, so they're they're just some descriptions there that that you can see uh, illustrated. Excellent diagram, excellent. Yeah. Now now these are these are the some some of the known. Uh, Kimberlites worldwide, you can see it's pretty catastrophic. They're pretty much they pretty much exist all over the world in pretty much every continent. But um, there, there's an example of a of a Kimberlite, and uh, another one that's an open op, open mine. Now this is this is this is the Kimberlites that uh, Professor McQueen was talking about. There's three stages to them. As you can see, stage one, stage two, stage three, and uh, that's a close-up of uh, stage two. Uh, Professor McQueen covered this in another stream that we had uh, months ago, where it's a, more more like a funnel where the the magma is ejected through through the earth through a funnel type system, yeah. and as it comes as it comes out, it goes. What did you say, Professor McQueen? Boom! Oh yes, it's a it's a very rapid, catastrophic yeah. uh, movement of lava up, bringing diamonds, as we will talk about next hour, yeah. uh, from that crust mantle boundary. Yeah, you can see some more uh, diagrams there uh, of uh, the Kimberlite, just illustrating exactly what actually happens. Um, it is. Uh, that, by the way, is a diamond if you haven't seen it. But in particular, I think it's the the uh, South Africa diamond. I think it's about uh, 83, 84 carats. So a pretty big diamond. I'll show, I'll show. There, there, there's a um, a diamond in in inside the rock there. Another view of it, and another one. Some more diamonds. Okay, who can tell me what that is? That's a, uh, is that an actual rock that is called a kimberlite? That's correct. Kimberlite, yeah, 10 out of 10. Uh, okay, that's that's the Star of Africa. Sorry, I forgot the name. That's, that's, that's the Star of Africa. That shows you the size of the diamond. It's a pretty big diamond. And very impressive, actually. But um, look, uh, uh, yeah, without sort of going into too much, but um, Professor McQueen talked about how the continent was shaped through through the. I guess uh, we found certain fossils via the various continents, and and using those fossils, we can actually um, tie. 
the general uh, sort of sequence of of the continents. Yes. Uh, that, that, yeah. Now that's not a complete one, of course, but um, it shows you how using those fossils they can actually show that um, these continents w were once uh, connected. As, and you as, can see there. Leave that yep. for a second. Yeah. You can see there what what the the South African geologist called the Rodina. Uh, Antarctica uh, is right up there against yep. uh, South Africa. Yep. And uh, when we go back to my screen, we'll be able to see that peninsula that you see there. Yeah, uh, we'll talk. Uh, do you want to talk about the geology of uh, some of these, uh, David? Because I've got some very good um, photos of... Um, oh, yes, you do. Uh, yes, you do. And... Um, so if I if I can go to the very, oops, whoop, I think I've gone t up too far. Now this is the secular illustration of how these uh, folded folded rocks um, or the Cape Fold Mountains happened. Yes, but they they say originally these two land masses were moving in the opposite direction, creating this um, inland sea which um, resulted in sediments being washed into the base of it. Yes. But uh, through, through, um, through, through, oops, through, um, what happened there? Uh, uh, my my, my uh, computer's been playing really funny things. Uh, okay, we can go back to it uh, later. Uh, sorry about the important thing, and as you search for it, I can comment, the important thing about it is that that Falkland area separated from the African area, probably in the early part of the flood. And so those sediments were laid down as rocks were washed in uh, to uh, the basin to the east of modern, uh, I'm sorry, to the west of modern South Africa. And then they were compressed as the flood year goes on into uh, folded rocks which are found predominantly along the coastal region. This might be a good time to break and take uh, uh, a question. Uh, I see in my uh, private chat a question about dinosaur eggs. Yes. Yeah, we got a bunch of questions in there. Uh, Professor McQueen, is that the one you wanted to, to start yeah, with? Let, uh, I'll, I'll take that one and then George can take the one about the White Cliffs of Dover, which seemed to pop up every month, but it's an important <laughs> issue. Yeah. Um, if you want, I can read this out. Yeah, uh, please read it while I get a sip of coffee here. So the question for Professor McQueen is, critics point to nests of dinosaur eggs that are found in several places around the world. And they assert it is impossible that dinosaurs could have had enough time to create these nests and lay their eggs while they were fleeing from rising from rising waters during the global flood to reach higher ground. Is this really a, a problem for our model, Professor McCoy? No, not at all. Let me let me point out the weakness of, of the argument. Um, the um, <clears throat> if I move my head to this side. I hope you can see behind me the geologic column. Now, this starts with the recent and goes back through the time of dinosaurs. I hope you can see a long neck dinosaur right on my shoulder, right on this side here. And these zones have been interpreted by Dr. Gary Parker and many others as being ecological zones. So, the dinosaur eggs that are preserved in the rock record uh, were buried in the early part of the flood. And some people, when I say that, will say, oh, come on, McQueen. What in the world are you talking about? The dinosaur fossils are way above the base of the Grand Canyon. Well, that's in the evolutionary construction. Uh if you find dinosaur eggs, then that becomes automatically Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous to Johnny Clock the Queen, as I've taught you. So if you find a dinosaur egg, that becomes Triassic. But from a creationist standpoint, from a flood geology standpoint, 
that uh, group of dinosaur eggs, and again, let me use my grandchild's toys here, imagine these to be a group of basalts that are found in India called the Deccan Plateau basalts. And on top of that, there are Mesozoic rocks. And so the evolutionary community considers there's a broad gap in between uh, these basalts and the uh, dinosaurs. They would call that an unconformity. From a flood geologist standpoint, these dinosaurs were living on that uh, plateau and they were rapidly buried during the first six months of the flood. It is only an evolutionary assumption about the age of the dinosaurs that makes it seem contradictory. Okay, George, you can go on to the White Cliffs of Dover. Okay, oh, let yeah. me read that question out, uh, brothers. Great answer, Professor McQueen, to a common objection, uh, a, a common talking point that I should say is, is repeated, even though it's been dealt with. So next question is, the White Cliffs of Dover on the eastern coast of England consist of chalk layers up to more than 350 feet thick. Is this a problem for the global flood model? Uh, I'll let Brother George start, and then I have a comment at the end. Uh, no, it's actually more of a problem for uh, the old Earth um, uh, scenario. Um, th th look, there are two forms of uh, limestone. Most people think that it's only the um, fossiliferous type limestone, but we know that limestone can also be made um, chemically, and it's been shown... Um, through uh, pumping of CO2 gas into deep down into the earth where uh, temperatures are hot, that uh, it creates limestone. They've also observed limestone being created during volcanic uh, eruptions. Now, the, problem, the, the, the reason why I say it's more of a problem for old earth geologists is because, um, well, you look at the erosion, for example, of uh, the White Cliffs of Dover, uh, they're, 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 they're eroding at remarkable rates. They're, if the earth is billions of years old, there shouldn't be any uh, England, to be honest. Uh, uh, the, the, other, the other thing is with these limestones, they extend from England through Europe, the Middle East, over to America and through to Australia. Now, if you're looking for mega sequences, to show proof of a global flood. Well, there's there's one there, a mega sequence. Now, according yeah. to according to evolutionists, these um, limestones uh, deposit at a rate of about one to three centimeters per per thousand years. Yet we find numerous fossils uh, like uh, nautiloids, nautiloids in the standing position. Uh, large fish, um, uh, brachiopods, uh, etc., that have been um, fossilized in in a manner that would suggest there is no way that those creatures could have stood there patiently while those um, creatures were fossilized at that kind of rate. Yeah, yeah that's, that's why a I say. Point. Yeah, that's why I say it's more of a uh, shooting yourself in the foot sort of question. Yes. I think that they're, they're all, just to cover it a bit further, there are also studies that have been done on the deposition rates of, uh, of limestone. And uh, under certain uh, catastrophic conditions, they do find that the production of these um, organisms uh, are, I think, from memory, a billion fold to what they... Um, um, form under natural conditions. So, uh, I mean, the, the global flood was a catastrophic event. So yeah. where there was lots of heat involved. Uh, so, no, it's not a problem for us. Actually, no. it's more of a problem for the let, old earth uh, let, scenario. Let me add my two cents worth. If you look at a lot of World War II movies and you see ships off the area of Dover, the White Cliffs of Dover, 
they are white because they've got microfossils in them. And those microfossils uh, form a chalk. And I want to get a big piece of this so I can illustrate it uh, next month to uh, the students here in our class. But the point that George made, let me carry over. Those same uh, Devonian um, uh, chalks also appear, let me move my hand here, in the state of Texas, just a five-hour drive west of where I live here in Louisiana. And here they're called the Austin chalk. And as George correctly pointed out, as you move to Europe, there are chalks there. And so this is a mega sequence, uh, a thick bed of rock. Now, remember the limestone divides into two parts. This kind of limestone here that's filled with microfossils is a fossiliferous limestone, but this is super. It's, you know, there's almost no uh, uh, ordinary layers and so forth. It's just a massive group of microfossils. Now, in the flood model, we want to look, as we suggested earlier, we want to look at the picture on the front of the jigsaw puzzle. The White Cliffs of Dover are just one of the 500 pieces that we got to put together. The viewpoint of creation and the flood provides us a context for the rapid killing of millions and billions of these microfossils because the wee beasties just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time when the pH and EH and temperature of Noah's ocean changed and all billion of them were killed in Dover, in England, in Europe, in the Austin Chalk, all over the world they were killed because of this change in uh, ocean chemistry. So that's how I would add to what George said. Uh, I also want to say, David, the homogeneous uh, nature of the limestone, uh, there's no way that um, 350 feet of limestone could be that homogeneous over such a long period of deposition. You, you, would, you would definitely see other materials contaminating that deposit of limestone if it was that long, uh, long age that they actually propose. Uh, Professor McQueen, okay, uh, let me take Shelley's question, if you'll read it for the group uh, Standing for Truth. Definitely, definitely. So thank you so much for your question, Shelley. The question is, are thunder eggs actually fossil eggs or are they just rocks? Well, here we get into the marketing of geologic materials. I can take you, Shelley, to places in the uh, western part of the United States that a uh, circular type of rock called a septarian nodule is sold as a thunder egg. I can go to other parts of the Western US where there is a, a rock uh, that is agate, that if you cut it over, it's quite beautiful with layers and bands, and it's called a thunder egg. Uh, who knows uh, whether fossil eggs are actually marketed this way. I bought a lot of rocks in my 50 years as a professional geologist, and I don't think there's a standardization on that term. I appreciate that, Professor McQueen. Now, can I give uh, some homework for uh, next hour and also next month, Standing for Truth? Absolutely. I went back in preparation for today to the ore petrology book that I used uh, when I was an undergraduate at the University of Tennessee. It's written by a uh, professor uh, who's, who's passed away several years ago, uh, Stanton. He was a professor in uh, Australia, uh, quite famous for his study of, of uh, ores. Remember that the word petrology 
is the study of the rocks associated with an ore. Uh, Andrew Stelling and I have been working for several years, and we think that in addition to igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary rocks, there actually should be a fourth type of rock, one that contains copper, lead, zinc, gold, silver, uranium, diamonds, that's valuable, and that would be called ore petrology. Well, you can probably buy this 1972 book for a dollar on Amazon, and I would encourage you to do that and look at these pages, screenshot it, 52 to 53, and page 71. Because as we see next hour, Stanton uh, comments about the mineralogy of diamonds, and how there's plenty of room for carbon-14 to be in the crystal structure. Now, back in the uh, 60s when he was studying this, nobody ever even looked for carbon-14, and so uh, they would have considered it an oddball. Uh, he doesn't even mention it in his book, but the modern research of rate that we've talked about before and that we'll return to um, will uh, show us that uh, this issue of carbon-14 and diamonds is a huge issue. Now, let me give you a foretaste. We're coming up on five minutes here, being an hour. And so let me give you a foretaste of what we're going to talk about next time. If you remember this uh, term for the lower, for the upper Precambrian, you'll notice it runs from a billion years to just short of 500 million years. So that gives us a framework for the diamonds in the Kimberlites that we're going to talk about in South Africa. So you got a bracket there between a billion, thousand million years and 500 million years. Now tell me how in the world can you find carbon-14 in the crystal structure of these diamonds when carbon-14 is completely gone away. Is it 50,000 years, George? Am I remembering that correctly? Uh, well, they say there shouldn't be any um, carbon-14 left after 100,000. But uh, we do we do find detectable uh, C14 in uh, samples that are data less than that. Uh, yeah. Now, before, be, before we actually go delve deep into the carbon-14 uh, in the diamonds issue, uh, David, I'll, I'd like to share the screen and show you some of the some of the geology in South Africa. Yes, that uh, shows uh, that there's evidence for a global flood. So, standing, I'll share the screen again and yeah. show you some nice some nice pictures that we can talk about. Good. And while George does that, I need to. My coffee has grown cold, so I'll take my one hour break now and let George talk you through this, and I'll be back in a few minutes, okay? Standing for truth. Sounds good, Professor McQueen. Sounds good. I appreciate okay. it. Go ahead and drop my... And George, you take your time, brother, because my coffee's sitting upstairs cold too. So I'll be listening, but you know me, I need my coffee. So I'm going to go grab that, and the floor is yours, brother. Take your time, man. Uh, no worries. Thank you. Uh, so some of these pictures are going to show uh, from the Cape Fold Mountains in South Africa. And you can see um, some remarkable folds there that um, illustrate the point of uh, global flood. Now, you've got to remember under secular uh, explanations, these folds can only occur if the material is ductile and it, it attains ductility through heat. And um, in the case of shales, they estimate that the um, that that material should be under about four and a half to about seven kilometers depth, which means if these folds are on the surface of the earth, it, it suggests that four and a half to seven kilometers of erosion has occurred to reveal them. And of course, under, even under their own uh, erosion rates, that's that's impossible. But I'm going to show you a couple more photos where these folds are actually shown in better detail. And you'll see some of them are just remarkable. These folds are amazing. They're almost at 90 degrees. 
So there, there, there's from from um, a young Earth creationist point of view, the global flood, we can explain that very easily. Those layers were moist when the Earth was uh, when the continents were compressed, and hence we find those those folds occurring because they were moist and and uh, they could easily bend in that manner. You'll see there an entire mountain, an entire mountain range of folding. You see, you see the individual layers as well. Okay, the individual layers. Now, if if these individual layers took, uh, in some cases, hundreds of thousands to hundreds of millions of years to um, form, some of those bottom bottom layers would be as as excuse the pun hard as rock, and folding like that would would literally fracture them and, and break them. But you, you see that they're nicely folded without a lot of evidence of, of fracture. Uh, here's another one. Notice the different different colors uh, suggesting it's different sediment type. Uh, you couldn't expect that um, hundreds of millions of years would, would deposit one material and then that material goes um, – astray and there's nothing left of it and then it's replaced by a different material and then the other material comes back etc cetera, etc cetera. now we, we've we've shown through um flume experiments the the stratigraphy that you see there of those particular layers is is possible under um, uh, moving water and uh it's not a problem for us a uh, big problem for secular geology there, there's there's an entire mountain again of folds, and this is why the Cape Fold Mountains are such a great example of um, you know uh, flood geology. There's another one, Table Mountain. Notice that um, clean cut of the mountain that can only occur by through water. I think you find the same example at the Grand at the Grand Canyon. So there's lots of evidence for for a flood in those Cape Fold Mountains. More folds. It's amazing how, how much folding actually occurred in those ranges. Another, another one. The evidence is undeniable. There, there, there's an example of more layering of different, different colored materials. And notice the clean edge between those two different materials. That, that can't occur under secular geology where they propose um, millions of years of erosion uh, between, the, between the layers. And that, uh, I'll leave that for Professor McQueen to explain, but I believe that's, that's uh, either a lava dome or, or maybe a, a craton that's been pushed up uh, through tectonic plate movements. And we've already covered covered that particular um, map there, and and I'll show you. Just, uh, they they've done this through the identification of similar fossils in different continents, and you can see those uh, Brazil versus Africa, and I think they've done the same thing at the tip of uh, South America, and. Uh, Elsewhere in the world, uh, these are the trilobite fossils that have been found, and they can actually link them via via the finds and find out just which continent was um, and, and how it was actually connected to the other continent. Some more uh, more information there. Well, I've covered that bit. So, uh, kimberlites we mentioned um, and what they were and the uh, the South African diamond, the, the star of South Africa. Oh, there it is, 83.5 carats. So I said 84, so it was fairly close. That's around 16.7 grams. That's a very large diamond, by the way. You, usually, you know, uh, one one gram is, a, is considered a pretty large diamond. So to find one 16.7 grams is, is humongous. Okay, I'll stop sharing, and hopefully the rest of the gang's back. Yeah, I'm here. And um, put that we can last continue. diamond, put that last uh, star of Africa diamond up, and I can okay. use that to uh, talk about what you will find when you read these pages in Stanton's 1972 book. 
Uh, so go ahead and share the screen again and put that diamond back up. And we'll use that oh. as a, a start, George. Please. Okay, there you go. Okay, yeah, leave it there. Now, a natural diamond has faces, F-A-C-E-S. A cut diamond like these, those are called facets. They're man-made. But inside those facets are the actual cubic uh, crystal structure of diamond. And what Stanton points out in his book is that because of the nature of the cubic crystals of, of diamond, diamond has plenty of room to have inclusions in it. Now, those of you that have uh, uh, studied uh, diamonds, and I have a chart in my book uh, that deals with the different aspects of a diamond, how much does it weigh, what its color is, and so forth. Inclusions lower the value of diamonds. So the reason that, make, that a diamond like this is so valuable is it has very few of these inclusions. Our argument, and a good crystallographic argument, is there's absolutely no problem uh, for having atoms in that diamond crystal structure. You know, a diamond is carbon, pure carbon, but because it's cubic, there could be zinc in there and other things that give inclusions and color to a diamond. Okay, you can go back to my screen now, and I'll make a further comment. So uh, when we think about the one world continent in the time before the flood, I can use my noodle here as a pointer. If I can figure out which way to put it. Do you see this peninsula here, George, if I can move it correctly? Oh, yeah. See that yep. peninsula there? Yes. That's the peninsula that's on your map earlier. And this is the connection between Antarctica and South Africa. Huge yep. craton right in, right in that area. And so now let's move on to a further discussion about the geology of South Africa. The excellent photographs that George just showed us illustrate two very important points. There are sedimentary rocks in South Africa, as evidenced by those layered units that you saw and the folding that you see. I don't have the Play-Doh out today, but the noodle will serve just as well. Because the noodle is soft like the rocks were before the flood, the noodle can be bent into an anticline or a synclinal smiley face because it is soft and malleable. It's a very pointed argument that George and I have made over the last six months that the rock mechanics of, uh, of structural steel and rocks are such, if you have a rigid thing like this marker and you put pressure for a long time, slowly over it, it's going to break. It's not going to bend. The second important point in the pictures that George showed is that Table Rock Mountain that's in uh, uh, South Africa, the other plateaus, and the rounded, probably granite uh, intrusions, all these are what uh, Steve Austin has called antique geomorphology. Now, what does he mean by the word antique? Well, many of the side canyons in the Grand Canyon are not eroding today, not at the level that would produce an amphitheater in the Red Wall limestone. The, what would be called the geomorphology or the topography of South Africa is the same thing. These enormous features were eroded by rapidly moving water off the, the continent of uh, Africa and into the oceans to the east and to the west 
the Atlantic and the uh, on the west and the Indian Ocean on the right. Can you see this concept I'm talking about, George, about antique geomorphology? Uh, yeah, that's a new term that I hadn't heard before. Yeah. And so that is uh, that is very valuable. Now, if we go back to uh, some of the diagrams that I showed earlier, we can elaborate on a on a very important point. And um, let me use this particular diagram here to illustrate my point. This is a, a craton that uh, is called the Kopval. And in Zimbabwe, it's given a slightly different name. And in Namibia, it's given a slightly different name. And so forth. Well, this craton is a group of rocks without fossils. As I prepared for our class today, I went back and looked at the geog geology of South Africa that, that uh, George showed us the geologic map earlier. And I was um, impressed with how much time it would take me to explain to the Standing for Truth audience about the great dike that runs from South Africa all the way up into Zimbabwe, the amount of time it would take to explain about the copper, lead, zinc, gold, silver deposits all over this part of Africa. One thing that concerns me, remember that I'm trained at the University of Michigan as a mine geologist. Economic geology is something we talked about episodes before. Um, we, economic geologists, are frightened about what's happening in South Africa. Why would I say that? In South Africa, in Zimbabwe, in the old days, let's go back to 1960, 1970, 1980, the countries friendly to the, re to the West mined the uh, cobalt. You cannot make an airplane without cobalt. I once worked on a team that looked at cobalt resources in America, and they're vanishingly small. If we can't import from places like South Africa and Zimbabwe, we are really hurting. When I did my geologic field work in uh, Zimbabwe in 2019, I, I was fortunate to be allowed to be a visiting professor in geology and geography at uh, the University of Zimbabwe. And one of the frightening things that I learned is that the communist Chinese are systematically mine by mine, country by country, buying up the mineral resources of uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Why? The governments themselves, the governments of Zimbabwe, the government of uh, Botswana, uh, in the old days it was called Congo Brazzaville, Congo Kinshasa. These, these countries are financially destabilized. Their currency compared to the yen is uh, dead. And so I want you to understand that the geology we talk about, the creation week geology, the flood year geology, has tremendous geopolitical implications. Did I explain that well, you think, George? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just going through my um, diamonds uh, notes and um, I wanted to bring up a point. Uh, someone actually made, uh, I think, a few weeks back. Uh, claimed to be a, a geophysicist, PhD, and a, and a, profe and a professor like yourself. Yes. But uh, what, what, the the carbon fourteen issue, David, it's um, it's littered with rescue devices. It's a real problem for the old old Earth explanation. Yes. Uh, one one of the things that uh, that I've heard is that uh, carbon dating can only be uh, done on organic materials. Uh, but they consider diamonds to uh, be uh, inorganic. But 
this is a moot point. The yes, fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is, they find carbon fourteen, whether it's organic or inorganic, it doesn't yeah. make one iota of difference. Yeah. Let me teach you now, some mineralogy here. Yeah. Uh, if you only have carbon in a diamond, uh, that is called the diamond is considered inorganic. But if you begin to look at coal and you begin to look at the chemistry of our own bodies, there's always carbon and oxygen and nitrogen involved in DNA and so forth. And so the whole field of organic chemistry is based around carbon. It's inaccurate for that uh, critic earlier to say, oh, a diamond is on the chart in the mineralogy book as an inorganic uh, mineral. Well, that's true on one level, but it's a very unique kind of inorganic. The carbon atoms form uh, uh, tetrahedrons in the, uh, uh, in the diamond structure. And those tetrahedrons, remember, tetra means four. And so there, there's a carbon atom and then four carbon atoms around it, forming a cubic structure. And that structure is so large that elements like zinc, elements like chromium, elements like zirconium can get in that crystal structure. Well, we're arguing that carbon-12, carbon-14... If you think of it as an element, it too can get in that structure. And so the very important point, and let me go back to my noodle here. The very important point is that during the, the pre-flood time, when you've got pre-Cambrian rocks, rocks without fossils, creation week rocks, when those Kimberlite dikes erupted up very quickly, they had to be, according to the secular chronology, between a billion years old and 500 million years old. This is a deal breaker. It's a model breaker. You know, if we talk about what data fits the model of creation, what data fix, fits the model of old earth chronology, the reason that people go nuts when standing for truth talk about talks about carbon-14 and diamonds is that it drops a model in billions and millions of years down to what George and I were talking about earlier uh, of anywhere from 500 thousand years to a hundred thousand. Did I say that right, George, that the half-life of carbon-14 is somewhere between 500,000 and uh, no, 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 no. 50, uh, carbon, 50. Car carbon 14's half life is 5,730. Okay, uh, 5,000. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. you see, if you can find anything at all that's been decaying over a 5,000 year period in rocks that are supposed to be a billion or 500 million years old, I think even a, a fifth grader, a 10 year old, who's had basic earth science in school will see the contradiction in that. This is why the people that George has talked to in the past and I've talked to in the past on standing for truth, they invent elaborate uh, rescue devices for this idea. You want to react to that, George? Yeah, yeah I, ju I, ju I just want to share my screen just to um, give uh, the audience a bit more information on um, on the carbon four day or organic and inorganic. I'm impressed. You're addicted uh, to Oh, that. yeah, yeah. Oh, you, you did it <laughs> to me. You did it to me. <laughs> I'm, sorry. I'm a bad okay. influence, brother. Go can ahead. You see, can, you see, can you see that? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Okay, this comes from the Gemological Institute of America, uh, the acronym GIA. This is what they say, right? I'm quoting. There are really only two sources for the carbon in natural diamonds. It can either come from carbon that has never left the Earth's mantle, which scientists, scientists call primordial, 
or it can be recycled carbon that has been released from the mantle and incorporated into the organic matter like bacteria or algae or subsequently formed carbon-bearing materials like graphite or carbon-rich rocks like limestone or marble. These materials have, have then been carried back into the Earth's mantle by subduction, releasing the carbon for diamond formation. This is the secular explanation, okay? This is what Do Dr. Wang says. If you see very negative carbon isotope composition, say minus 24, C13. In most cases, this carbon is, is of organic origin. So they might be formed, so, sorry, they might be coming from the surface of the earth. Now they've done they've done tests on fossilized wood samples, and you can see it, in these samples here, those uh, C13 PD, uh, I forget what the B stands for, but you can see that uh, they're around about the night the negative 24 mark which suggests they're they're um organic okay that uh, obviously it's it's wood so it's organic so they find the same same uh carbon 13 uh measurement in diamonds so the diamond is organic and i i call that a shooting yourself in the foot because this particular person that we had commenting a few weeks ago yes cited this particular paper taylor and southern use of natural diamonds to monitor uh, carbon-14 AMS instrument backgrounds. Uh, now, the reason why I say it's a shooting yourself in the foot question is because when you look at their results, th they found carbon-14 in those diamonds, which suggested they were, they were 60 to 80,000 years old. But surprise, surprise, guess what? They put it down to contamination. I'd like to know why is it whenever creation young earth creationists do these tests and we find young ages they always say contamination but if they do carbon 14 and they get the answer they want it's never contamination but in the case of the diamonds that they actually tested themselves and found measurable quantities of carbon 14 they put it down to contamination in the ams Okay, let me let me uh, let me make a comment there, George, if I may. Yeah. Um, the reason that this is so important to the evolutionary community is even the most uh, faithful, even the most uh, committed evolutionist cannot imagine the evolution of life in six thousand years. They must have billions of years to be able to mix into this pudding, mix into the primordial soup to get that first amoeba, to get that first uh, uh, organism. And so if they were to admit that there's objective scientific evidence that the earth is only 5,000 years old, according to carbon-14 uh, in um, diamonds, then they would have to go one additional step and say, well, the decay of the Earth's magnetic field leads us to a, a value of around 10,000 years. But wait, we're coming up with thousands instead of billions. And that breaks our model. You know, standing for truth, you've always encouraged me to go back to the Bible and to see how things fit into God's word. And so let's see where this uh, South Africa fits in to the argument. Now, this is the third day. Listen to this. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters. He called seas, plural. And God saw that it was good. And then it goes on to talk about and let the earth bring forth grass. Well, let's look at the Hebrew of this and think through it. Okay, if our model's correct and there's one world continent shaped like a sea for creation, if viewed from outer space, then the way the scriptures would uh, describe it, and let me get my diagram that I've drawn out here to show you uh, 
Well, what I'm talking about, you see, he would use the word land because there was one world continent. He would use the word seas because depending on where you are in relation to Eden, if this is a model of where Eden is, Adam and Eve could walk down and see what in the old days was called the Tethys Sea uh, in this area here. And there would be an ocean uh, near South Africa and Antarctica, and then a north, east, south, and west ocean. So you can see where the scriptures would use the word seas, plural, but land, singular. And so by looking at the secular literature and how they put together a continent they want to call Rodina or Gondwana land, all the different words that have been used over the last 50 years, this is in agreement with the biblical model. If you want to use the word flood geology, then all this is happening before the beginning of the flood. But you can I hope you can see, those of you that are, students wanting to learn in our Standing for Truth audience that the creation week, young earth, flood geology model fits the data better than the uh, evolutionary model. I know Standing for Truth, you have a viewpoint on that issue also. Yeah, David, uh, sorry, Standing. Uh, David, I've, I've got more more examples of carbon 14 it's not just in diamonds but there are yeah please it, please share that with the group yeah yeah uh so standing uh, sorry i'm going to share the screen because i just want to make sure I, I get through all of these points that i've made because it's relevant um okay so what what uh, what we've done we actually accessed uh i think 10 samp coal samples uh according to secular geologists the, those uh, layers where they source these samples were ranging between 40 million to 250 million years. And you can see the 10 samples there. And those, those particular samples are radiocarbon dated ages of 21,000 to about 45,000 years. So, and bear in mind here, uh, Dr. Paul Jem. Uh, uh, published an article uh, in which uh, he tabulated about 70 AMS measurements. In actual fact, there were 89 measurements of various um, samples that showed, uh, you know, intrinsic measurable quantities of carbon-14. And, and these are it here. You can, you can screenshot these later if you like, but um, you can see they found, found it in... Um, uh, marble, shell, foraminifera, uh, graphite, calcite, uh, wood, anthracite, uh, right through to, you know, there, there's, they're the 89, full 89 of them. You can see all measured intrinsic carbon-14. And hello, hello, they just tell you that it's contamination. But if, if it is contamination... And, and you've got to understand that they actually use carbon-14 dating on some of these um, archaeological artifacts. They accept, they accept those dates because it agrees with their uh, narrative. But if it's, if it's anything over 10,000 years, they consider that a fossil and it should be in the millions of years. So they have to say it's contaminated. Now, just to give you an, in, an indication, the, the, the actual... Um, I'll just go back. I'll stop sharing. There, there, there are, there are two. There are two objections to the carbon fourteen issue. They say that um, contamination can occur in situ, but as we as we said, diamond is considered the hardest substance on earth, and like Professor McQueen noted, the carbon lattice structure is so tightly packed, leaching from surrounding material cannot pen, penetrate its interior. We do, however, and we've mentioned this earlier, that we do find free nitrogen inside the diamonds, and there may be a mechanism 
from nearby uh, radiation from uranium to, con to convert this nitrogen to C14. But um, tests have been done and calculations have been done to show that the, this, uran this radiation acting on the free nitrogen in the diamond can only account for a, a maximum of one in 10,000th of a parts per modern carbon. That's 0 0.0001. The AMS can only measure to 0 0.001 to the third decimal point. So this, this rescue device of the uranium or the radiation coming from the uranium is just that. It's a rescue device. It doesn't hold water. The other one is uh, they talk about leaching, uh, in particular with the uh, coal, coal samples, leaching from the, from the coal uh, into uh, surrounding materials. And one, one particular person said to me, you know, if it's, if it's leaching carbon-14, why isn't it leaching carbon-12? I said, who said, who said I didn't – did I say that, that carbon-12 wasn't leaching? But they forget the fact that for every one carbon-14 atom, there are one trillion, one trillion carbon-12 atoms. So if you leach out one carbon-14 and one carbon-12, that makes no difference to the result. It's, it's ridiculous arguments. And, of course, the favourite one, as I said, is the laboratory background contamination. Now, now – oh, these labs are run by scientists, professional scientists. They do regular testing to determine that background contamination value, and they subtract it from their measurements. Now, in this, yes. in this, uh, in this Southern and Taylor uh, paper, uh, this particular person that that mentioned it brought it up, brought it to my attention. I actually. Uh, researched that and I actually spoke to Dr. Baumgardner. This is what that particular person said. Then I'll, I'll read to you what Dr. Baumgardner said about his comment. He, he says, Delta C14 is constant. These are the, uh, the diamonds that they sample from Brazil, by the way. And they were actually, they were actually done by, um, uh, get a lot of this, they were done by uh, the uh, University of California um, and the um, Keck Accelerator Mass Spectrometer Laboratory in the University of California. So, so they, these are their results, but this is what he says. He says uh, that they find that the Delta C14 is constant across individual diamond faces that were measured by Taylor Southern, but Delta C13 is highly variable due to mass-dependent fractionation. There ought to be a correlation if the C14 signal was intrinsic to the diamond and not sourced from machine background or other or some other source. But there is no such correlation because the C14 is not intrinsic to the diamond. This is the conclusion he made, right? But I contacted Don, Dr. Baumgardner and he was kind enough to reply, even though he was on his hospital bed. Uh, he, he says, yes, I have some comments to make. It says first the cross section of the uh, nitrogen 14 to the carbon 14 reaction is much higher than the carbon 13 to carbon 14. He says much more than a factor of 10. I think it's a lot more than 10. Also, nitrogen tends to pre present in most diamonds at moderate levels, high enough that most of the C14 is likely from the thermal ne neutron reactions with the nitrogen atoms. To me, it is very bizarre that there would be a large carbon-13 variation in a single diamond, but zonation, uh, as the diamond formed, I guess that is possible. However, he says, if the nitrogen contamination were relative uniform, that would lead to relatively uniform distribution of the resulting carbon-14. And that's what they found. They, 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 because one of the diamonds, they actually um, cut up into six different diamonds and they looked at the carbon-14 and they found uh, similar carbon-14 readings in those um, diamonds that they cut from the single diamond. And from there, from there they make the uh, 
assumption that because all these samples have got the same reading or relatively the same reading carbon-14, it must be background radiation or background contamination that's doing it. Now, but let me interject. Let me interject at this point a quote from Stanton's or Petrology to give you a mineralogical view of this. Now, this is written at a graduate level, so let me read the sentence and then explain the words. This is on page 52. Interstitial impurity diffusion in monoatomic crystals. So this is a crystal like uh, graphite or, or diamond that's got monoatomic, in other words, got carbon in it. It has already been pointed out that interstitial impurities, so two mineralogists, carbon-14 inside the diamond lattice is interstitial. It's inside there, are the most common in host having open structures. In dealing with their diffusion, we are therefore cheaply concerned with crystals of wide spacing. Now listen to what he says here a characteristically open structure of wide occurrence in the mineral kingdom is that of diamond, but it's not alone. Uh, silicon has this, uh, sphalerite, zinc sulfide, uh, uh, copper iron sulfide has it, many others. The arrangement is such that each atom is at the center of a tetrahedron, the bonds being directed to the tetrahedral corners. And Inside this wide, this wide spacing is where the carbon-14 comes in and fits in. And so the reason when they cut that diamond up into the pieces that all the carbon-14 dated the same, George, is because it was all trapped. It was all trapped at the same time. And so if you understand the crystallography and mineralogy of diamond, their situation gets worse and worse and worse. And the young earth viewpoint rises like cream on top of the milk. Yeah, if I can finish off what uh, Dr. Baumgartner uh, said to me regarding that particular report. He, he says, uh, however, the solid case that Southern and Taylor make, that their machine background is so extremely low to me, almost eliminates the possibility that it could somehow account for the C14 in the diamonds. He goes on to say the carbon-13 variation within a single diamond is unusual in itself, which prompts me to wonder whether that variation might merely be reflecting the carbon-13 measurement statistics. Now, I won't read the rest of the email that he sent me, but um, it's more of a personal nature. I, th I think I'll leave it at that. But um, look, the, 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 these eight... These eight um, diamonds that um, these uh, uh, these this University of California tested actually had ages radiocarbon ages of uh, sixty five thousand to eighty thousand years. The, as I said, the ninth diamond was cut into six equal fragments, which which were analysed individually. They yielded essentially identical radiocarbon ages ranging from uh, 69,400 to 70,600. Uh, then they say this suggests the carbon-14 was, was evenly distributed through, through this diamond, which is consistent with it being intrinsic carbon-14 and not contamination. So wh why would, would carbon-14 be evenly distributed somehow uh, mean that it's um, uh, contamination coming from the AMS? It's not. It just means that the nitrogen 14 in that particular diamond was evenly distributed when it was converted to carbon 14. So the, the, nothing more than than rescue devices. I, I went on to because when I was researching it, I went into these blog spots because that's where you'll see most of these refutation in blog spots. Yes. And mo most of these so-called experts in the blog spots. They'll review what uh, the creationists have said about um, the radiocarbon ages and pretty much on every one of those comments, the very last thing they'll say is creationists are liars. That's not an argument. I mean, that's no, not an argument. That's an ad hominem. That's an that's attack. That's ad hominem, person. yeah. I mean, and, as, as, I, know, as, I for, pointed, as I pointed out, there, there, there were samples in the coal beds that were dated 
48 to 50,000 years. Yeah. yeah. All, all, all sorts. And, and the other one too, David, why are they so scared? There was a paper, uh, I think by uh, they call themselves the Paleo Group. They're secular scientists. I think there were five or six scientists put up a paper at the conference in Singapore, an international conference. That paper was removed from the conference about an hour before it commenced. Why are they so scared of these results you know like they're, sci they're well, scientists they, to, they should be interested again the standing for truth audience needs to understand the incredible significance of this if it's really true that diamonds in the kimberlites in south africa that date have to date between a billion years and 500 million years if they're returning dates that are a couple of half-lives carbon 14 half-life is rounded up to about 6,000 years. Uh, this is a deal breaker. Now, those of you that are serious need to go on Amazon and buy this book. Oh, you might say, well, that's 50 years old, McQueen. Well, it is. But uh, Stanton's or Petrology is a standard text, and it presents a crystallographic support to what George has said about cutting these diamonds into pieces. And so serious students need to dive into this pretty deeply. Why do you not hear much about the geology of South Africa, Zimbabwe, Sub-Saharan Af Africa? Because in my study, and I've been looking at this in some detail since 2019, the geology is incredibly complicated. I barely know how to put together the different kinds of uh, igneous and metamorphic rocks that are associated with these uh, pre-flood rocks in South Africa. So it's a it's a topic that we can return to. May I uh, take one of the questions, standing for truth, and then I'd like to turn the rest of the time over to you and George uh, because we're coming up on our two-hour mark here. Yeah, Absolutely, uh, Professor McQueen. We've got a couple more questions here that have not yet been answered. Maybe I'll ask, uh, I'll ask this one because this question has been put forth by the critics. I've seen it many times. Okay. Where they ask, how did these rock layers harden so quickly after being laid down during the global flood? Okay, we'll go back to the noodle argument and the Plato argument. At the end of the flood as the waters were receding over the earth, the rock layers were uh, very flexible. Uh, the, uh, you know, it's, it's saying in the question, the limestone layers should show evidence of fossils being jumbled together by rushing water. Not so. This layer was buried. And again, we can use the limestones of the lower part of the Grand Canyon. We can use the limestones of the Appalachian Mountains in Tennessee. These rocks were laid down this way, and they were laid down quickly. The word for the this zone between the orange and the green is called a contact. These contacts are what are called knife edge. No evidence of erosion in between them. And so when these things get bent, like we've seen in South Africa, they're being bent in the immediate post-flood time, in a time that's called post-flood residual catastrophe. So when you look at the bending of these limestone layers and the faulting of it, you can see how they can be from the standpoint of engineering that, that George and I have talked about and rock mechanics You've got an anticline and a syncline. Yeah. We've got a question here, um, gentlemen, from Shelly. Thank you so much for your question, Shelly. Question for McQueen or Bond. Is there a difference between Canadian diamonds and African diamonds? Now, somebody did answer in the chat, though. Uh, Dell said Canadian diamonds tend to say A a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's my answer to that, and it's a matter of money. 
uh, the rate project around the year total uh, 2000, the rate project was very well funded. Hundreds of thousands of dollars was put in that project. Now the rate project has gone away. It's an issue of funding. Before we can test Canadian diamonds and diamonds from Arkansas, uh, a four-hour drive north of where I live, George, is Crater of Diamonds State Park, developed on a type of kimberlite called a lamphophere dike. And it's the only place that you can go in the whole world and uh, uh, collect diamonds. And uh, every week, there's a diamond of around uh, 0.5 carats found there. Ms. McQueen has been there. Ms. McQueen and I have been there two times. It's so frustrating to her uh, because uh, she looked so carefully and didn't find it. She's always better at finding fossils and stuff than I am. But if we were, if we had uh, another hundred thousand dollars contributed to the cause, we could analyze these diamonds from Canada, Arkansas, South Africa, and all the other places that you showed kimberlites there. Um, we could analyze these, but it's a matter of funding. Yes, it's expensive to buy diamonds, isn't it? Uh, Standing, can I can I just uh, share one more thing because um, we well, find you, um, yes, brother. But since we're at an hour and thirty six minutes, there is another question here that that oh. I would love to get to before Professor McQueen would have to go. Okay. Um, Okay, so the question here, Professor McQueen, is the critics have stated that if all limestone were deposited by Noah's flood during a giant tsunami, then all limestone layers should show evidence of fossils being jumbled by rushing water. The critics say this is not the case. Is this a, a plausible or a, a valid argument in your opinion, Professor McQueen? Okay, here we need to go to the idea of multiple working hypothesis. There are creation scientists that have their focus on impacts hitting the ocean waters during the flood and creating these tsunamis. Other creation scientists, flood geologists, say that uh, disruptions in the mantle uh, created the fountains of the Great Deep, and as the water came up, it created a tsunami. In my own personal model, I tend to de-emphasize that and look more to what George and I have talked about as the chemistry of Noah's ocean. Now, it's true that the Quiet Cliffs of Dover and other uh, rocks that uh, I can show you in the future are what are called fossiliferous limestones, no question about it. <clears throat> but a lot of limestones that are called micrites or Limestone muds are directly precipitated from the flood waters. And so there's no requirement that the fossils be jumbled. The only requirement is that they be buried. And the argument that we've used several times in the past of a clam that's got two sides to the shell, if you go to the beach in uh, Florida or in Eastern Australia and you look for modern clams, plesiopods that have been washed up, they're all popped open. Very, very rarely will you find that muscle still around even after a few days of being washed up on the beach. So our argument is the fact that many of these clams that are found in the Appalachian Mountains, in England, in the fossil bearing beds in South Africa, they are closed like this because they've been catastrophically buried. The the other explanation on the reverse side, David, is um, uh, according to secular geology, if the limestone is deposited one to three centimeters per thousand years, uh, we've observed uh, entire whale carcasses literally been eaten away including the bone within a year so how are you going to fossilize something 
when the a dead carcass is really eaten up by bacteria and worms, etc., in a single year. Okay, no very good point. Yeah. And let me make a final five-minute presentation and turn the rest of the time over to you guys, okay? I'm beginning to run out of my voice here. Uh, let me summarize it this way. When you look at rocks without fossils, the Precambrian rocks of uh, South Africa that I emphasize, those folded sedimentary rocks that George emphasized, whether you look at the Precambrian ones or the floodier ones, I hope you can see that the model that we're putting together is an adequate explanation for how you have rocks without fossils. You have one world continent created during the creation week before there was sin in the world. And so there are no fossils. There's no evidence of sin and death. You've got to go up to the time of the great flood, the time of Noah, to get that. Keep in mind that Methuselah was 969 years old. So at the very least, you've got uh, about a thousand years between uh, creation and probably more if you do the math uh, correctly in Genesis uh, 1, 5, 10, and 11. But let me go back to what I started with. What's the most important thing about putting the jigsaw puzzle of science together? Is you've got to see the picture on the front of the, of the box. Because the 500 pieces don't make any sense alone. You've got to have what the old Germans called the Weltbild, the structure of the world, which were provided in the book of Genesis. And so as we go week after week, Standing for Truth is committed to supporting what the Bible teaches. Gentlemen, with that, I'll uh, say good night and ask you to drop the video, and I'll look forward to our discussion next week. Good well, thank tonight. you so much, Professor McQueen. Uh, we really did miss you. I want to let everybody know in the chat. We've had a very lively chat tonight, Professor McQueen. It's been a great show. Uh, people definitely missed you. I want to let them know, especially because we've got some new viewers and subscribers. Check the description box for uh, the playlist with all of Professor McQueen's videos he has done with us. I think we're up to uh, between 20 and 25, maybe more. Um, but you'll find answers to all your most common uh, questions from the critics. We also have a debate that Professor McQueen did a couple months back with Jordan on accelerated nuclear decay. So please check that out. Uh, Professor McQueen, thanks again for joining us. The two hours has flown by. Another you know, fantastic It's show. amazing to me, Standing for Truth, that you've contacted three professional geologists, critics, and none of them will agree to debate me. <laughs> Maybe somebody will in the future. Yes, yes. If, if anybody knows anybody who's willing to debate Professor McQueen, who has some uh, some qualifications and, and knows the topic as well as Professor McQueen does, please, uh, please shoot me an email. So uh, again, Professor McQueen, I thank you so much for, for being here and giving us your time. You're an amazing blessing to this ministry. And uh, before you leave, uh, David, George, was there any uh, final words you wanted to make before um, before I drop David's feed here? Uh, yeah, yeah. Just to add to David's uh, answer to that last question, in in the Grand Canyon, they've they've estimated there are around over a billion uh, nautiloids and other fossils. Some are in the standing position, others um, are flat. But one of one of the striking indicators of of a water deposition is the direction most of these fossils are actually aligned in the in the one direction which means there was a water flow in that direction yeah that's okay, so remarkable that, that's an important point to make because if if you if these things occurred over millions of years and there's been water coming from every direction to lay them oh, of course. you should you yeah. should you shouldn't see you shouldn't see that that particular uh, geometry in those fossils. That is that is true. And I'll leave the rest of the show to you guys, and yep. I will see you next week. Okay, see God. You, see you, David. God bless, David. I've um, got one. I've got one last yep. point, point to make. Uh, standing, 
I, I need to share the screen because this is an objection that I've heard a few times and I just want to explain it to the audience and how we actually um, solve that particular problem that these evolutionists pose to us. So I'm yes. just going to... And, and just I just... Gonna, yep. Yeah. Well, I was just going to elaborate uh, for 10 seconds on what Professor McQueen was, was saying. So we... Um, our, our goal would be for Professor McQueen's next debate, our goal would, would be to have it against somebody who's also qualified in the field and can essentially match up in terms of, of a discussion with Professor McQueen because of course we have numerous evolutionists who'd be willing to debate, but I think a lot of the debate would just consist of them saying, I'm not a geologist. And there's not that much fun in that. So we are seeking, hopefully, a geologist or somebody who's knowledgeable on that topic to debate Professor McQueen. And, and so far, I've had a few decline. And what's funny is the few that have declined actually run websites and blogs where they spend a great deal of time supposedly debunking the arguments from people like Professor David McQueen. So it's funny that on their blog, they're more than okay with attacking the global flood model. But when offered the opportunity to defend those claims in a live discussion with a professional geologist like Professor McQueen, they they turn it down. So we find that funny. Plus, we have uh, Mike Oron frequently as well, who is aware of a lot of these websites. And he has... Uh, assured us that the arguments coming from these critics are not impressive. Anybody in the chat who has not yet seen, I think it was about three weeks ago, uh, I had Mike Ord on for almost a three hour broadcast titled Evolutionary Challenges Debunked or Answered. And um, I highly recommend that presentation because it was over an hour, his presentation that is, we did an audience Q and A afterwards. It was over an hour where he addressed thoroughly the, uh, I guess the so-called best objections to the global flood. So I definitely highly recommend watching that. We should be having Mike Ord on again next uh, next month. So be sure to bring your questions. Uh, yeah. So that being said, uh, George, brother, I want to hand it over to you. I see your screen is shared and you're good to go. Uh, okay. One of the points I want to make is uh, that particular um uh, article there, Japan's geologic history is in question after discovery of metamorphic rock uh, microdiamonds. Now, I'm not sure if you, you've been listening, but uh, the, uh, the secular explanation is that uh, diamonds occur deep down at 150 to 200 kilometres um, uh, within, within the Earth's um, uh, mantle. Okay, so the problem here is is they found micro diamonds in metamorphic rock. Metamorphic rock doesn't form at those depths. I'm sorry. So that's why they're looking at to rewrite Japan's geological history. But one of the things I wanted to bring up, one, one of the things they, they actually, the evolutionists will bring up and say, okay, if you've done all these uh, C14 um, dates, in these in these particular sample, why aren't they why aren't those C14 dates? the same that there's a variation in c14 dates well we can explain it via a number of ways first of all you've got to understand carbon dating does not measure the age it measures the ratio of c14 to c12 and that c14 to c12 ratio is based around a um, constant value that they've adopted uh pre-1940s now, the reason why it's pre-1940s is because they found, because of nuclear testing, the nuclear tests actually uh, generated uh, high levels of C14. So that's why they went to pre-1914. But th this is so, these are some of the other reasons, though. You can see that so, some of the C14 gets lost during fossilization and from exposure to water. Like I said, it's, it's, um, you know, it's permeable. It, it can move around. Uh, the other other example is the stronger magnetic field inhibited the C14 production. Uh, another example is if the atmosphere were millions of years old, then the C14-C12 ratio would be at equilibrium. 
the variation in C14 dates proves the ratio is not a constant and hence the atmosphere is not millions of years old. Now, since C14 is forming faster than it is decaying, it is impossible to know the pass ratio and get an accurate age calculation calculation by carbon-14 dating. The other example is the alteration effects such as fractionation of the carbon-13 correction. Also, you'll find volcanic eruptions and forest fires contaminate the atmosphere. Therefore, the C14, C12 ratio can be wildly different. We know, we know, we know carbon-14 is, is generated through cosmic rays from the sun by uh, reacting with the nitrogen-14 in the atmosphere. Now, we know that sun flares occur. Uh, I think they're predicting a sun flare to occur in the next year or two. You'll find these sun flares will also generate more carbon-14. So there's a number of diff uh, different explanations why those C14 ages can vary. Uh, and really, that's all I've got to, got to say to finish that off. I mean, every pretty much every objection they have has been answered, but do you think they would listen to it? Of course not. Amen, brother. Amen. Well said. Very well said. Um, another fantastic presentation. Great work to you and Professor McQueen. Um, a lot of compliments and kind things to say in the chat. And to any critics in the chat, uh, we at Standing for Truth, we believe in critical thinking. And as, uh, as you know, George, we host almost daily discussions, debates, lectures, presentations, interviews. Um, anybody new to the channel, check the playlist titled Interviews Hosted by Standing for Truth. There's about 65 plus interviews in there with numerous PhDs and experts in uh, various fields. Also check out the uh, debates hosted and moderated by Standing for Truth playlist. We've got well over a hundred now in there as well on all sorts of topics. So um, if there are any critics that, that are willing to discuss or debate these issues, like I said, we, uh, we don't believe in being a keyboard warrior. So please uh, feel free to either email myself or leave a comment in the description or in the uh, comment section of these videos. And we are happy to set something up. Um, so that being said, George, I'm going to give you some final words. Actually, let me go over a couple announcements or reminders again. Um, this Thursday, we've got the big debate, Rhodes versus Hoven on the age of the earth. The following week, another uh, big Age of the Earth debate, Kent Oven versus Smokey Saint. That's going to be a ton of fun as well. Make sure you are here for uh, this Wednesday, Dr. Frank Turek. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. That's going to be a ton of fun. Uh, we've been getting a lot of theology debates in there too. We just hosted a Trinity versus Oneness debate um, uh, last week. Please check that out. We also had a debate uh, on uh, the nature of hell. Uh, please check that out. We've got a Solid. It's a, an exciting end times debate in August, first week of August. Dr. Kent Hoven taking on Stacey Turbville. Uh, that's going to be a lot of fun as well. So I'm also in the works currently uh, about to confirm some more debates that I should have up on the upcoming live stream section of the YouTube channel shortly. So please check that out to make sure that you are staying up to date on all the upcoming upcoming events. George can tell you we've also got a uh, an event filled August because we're going to be having uh, Dr. Charles Jackson uh, back on. End of the month here, we're going to have John McKay, the creation guy, back on. Um, hopefully Mike Ward, Sal Jardina next month. And we're going to have Dr. Joseph Kazil back on as well in a couple of weeks for a, a highly technical lecture on junk DNA. You are not going to want to miss out on that one. That's going to be a ton of fun. And, so George, yeah, new, go ahead, brother. And and a new guest, Dr. Ken Coulson, associate yeah. professor, an associate professor. I'd just like to finish off uh, standing with something that our own Matt Mann has said uh, in, his, in the chat. He says, I'll just tell you now exactly what Jesus told those who saw no miracles, not signs of God. He says, more blessed are those who believe without seeing. Amen. I think that's very appropriate. 
Amen. Amen, brother. Well said. Well said. Uh, check out Matt, man, and myself. Uh, we did a video yesterday debunking Joel Duff. We went almost four hours, and that's why my voice uh, my voice is a little hoarse today. I think I uh, um, completely lost it, not to mention coffee probably doesn't help either. But <laughs> uh, any final thoughts, George? Any final words? As, as always, you did a great job, brother. And I know you've got a lot planned, too, in, in the future. A lot of critics we are going to be debunking some of these arguments that keep popping up. So George, any final words, my good man? Yeah, just remember what I keep saying. Evolution is nothing more than presupposition supported by vivid imagination, uh, biased and subjective interpretations, uh, outlandish uh, speculation and conjecture. That's pretty much what it is. It's <laughs> That's pretty much what it is, brother. The, 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 all, all the evidence they cite is really just interpretations to back up their own narrative. Amen. And, and, and thank you for having me. Uh, I, I kind of like the, the every two week um, sort of scenario because it gives me more time to prepare and do some research. And, we, and we, you can really see, especially tonight, you can see uh, just how much research and work you put into this. So to the audience, share this content around. We want it to get out to as many people as possible. It's important. It's 2021, and it's a great time to be a young earth creationist. The evidence really is on our side. Uh, Soggy Crawfish says, I hope Dr. Hoven's voice can hold up to this month's debate challenges on SFT. Uh, we've got them uh, scheduled for three debates in three weeks. So uh, Dr. Dino is going to be a busy man. <laughs> um, anyways, that being said, we will see you guys on Wednesday. George, again, great job. Professor McQueen, uh, great job. God bless brothers. And SFT and George Bond are out. Out.